Amy Odgers will be filming this evening's meeting. Um, See, that was said somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> First for your approval, the minutes from the January 11th meeting. Move we'll approval. Second. Second. And I think there have already been comments. Yes, yeah. there has. Uh, so, all in favor of accepting those minutes? Aye. Aye. Great. Uh, the Mindshift Institute, Trish Kornbeth and Michael Lennon, yes. um, are requesting an adjustment of the sandwich board um, annual fee because they plan to close in April. Yes, that's correct. Want to take a second and just... Okay. Yeah. All right, we, we uh, opened the center, called the Center for New Knowledge on uh, Main Street above Ultragal three years ago. and. But it turns out it wasn't self-supporting, so we're going to be closing. Uh, and uh, but our signboard permit expired, at, you know, in Jan at the end, of the beginning of January. And I know the policy is that you you sign up for one year fully for three hundred dollars. But since money is why we're closing, we're trying to preserve you know what's left in our nonprofit bank account. And we would appreciate if you would consider giving us an ex extension for. Till the end of April, which we a quarter of a year at a prorated hundred dollars instead of three. Third of a year. A third, sorry, third of a year. That's for a third of the fee. Year. That's well, our, we'd that's like to keep it there because it announces the events that we have, and since we only have four months, we'd like to have people yeah. know about it. And we're on the second floor, and people don't sure see it. So. Jim, uh, I read this over. It sounds like a very reasonable request to me. Uh, and since they have set a closing date uh, of four months, it's a third of the year, then I would make a motion to support that. I would second that. Any staff comment? Um, the only comment I have is so, if we have someone coming in in April to take over that signboard, will we charge them the full year as we typically do? Or we start? We had to when we came yeah. in. Right. Yeah. That's the board's call. Okay. My, con my concern is, um, I th I'm glad that you came, <coughs> and I, making your request is always a good thing. My concern is, though, if we have people coming throughout the year, will we be opening the door to people want prorated um, uh, signboard charges? And typically in the past, we've s what have we done for that? We've denied them all. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, and so people come in the middle of the year, they have to pay the full year amount. Uh, this is a, just a bit different, though. This is a standing client. Mm -hmm. This is someone that's been here for three years. They've already announced they're closing their business, mm -hmm. and they're asking for a prorate on a new thing. And I think it's a sensible thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really set a precedent because they're leaving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if they don't leave then, if for some reason or other they don't leave, then we would be back mm -hmm, to them mm -hmm. for the rest of the year. Uh, we'll call the question. All in favor of Jim's motion to allow the prorated fee? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, BJ, is there anything else you need from us? No. Okay. Do we need just one question? Do we need to just see? Uh, Come back and pay. Yep. You, see you can see Ann okay. um, during business hours, and I'll speak to her tomorrow. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, contract for a, a sander, capital sander, to J.C. Madigan in the amount of. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Nothing. Hold the proof. Hurry. Hurry while it's zero. How many, how many can we get? <laughs> <laughs> we put out a bid for a seven cubic yard stainless steel sander, and what we were trying to do is this we didn't have money for it. We were looking at liquidating some of our equipment that's no longer functioning. So we put out the bid that um, basically that. We are looking to get rid of a 1976, no, excuse me, 1979 military truck, Captain Hook, we called it, and the hook attachments that go with it in exchange for the new sander. The truck is not operational, it's sitting out in the backyard. So with this, um, basically, uh, Westside wanted $3,700 with the trade-in. 
GNS wanted four thousand dollars with the trade in, and JC Manigan took it in for zero with the trade in with the old equipment. So we think it's a pretty good deal. Joe Cook approved it. Thought it was a reasonable exchange. Shows how much. Motion we approve. Pardon me. Questions? Comments? The, 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 it's valued at twelve thousand four hundred twenty-two dollars. That's the value of it. The standard. Yeah. All right. No, excuse me. That is the vehicle with the stellar hoist and the sander on it. It's valued at $12,422. So basically it's a fair exchange of the equipment. All right, you lost me there. Yeah, because I thought you said the other one was the equipment that's no longer usable. Was that's salvage value. A four thousand. Yeah, so the body's rotting off of it. Yeah, yeah. And we'd have to put a lot of money into it again. And the twelve thousand, four thousand. Well, the other people wanted four thousand dollars with the trade to get the sander, the oh. same sander. Oh, that's what the four thousand came from. That's Sorry, right. That was from. So GNS it's a twelve thousand dollar sander body. Mm -hmm. Approximately. Approximately, they took it in for zero based on the value of the equipment we're looking to surplus. Yeah. Am I still not explaining this? If right? I went down in with just my checkbook and said I'd like to buy one of those, what would, it, what would the sander Approximately $12,400, I would say. Okay. So they're giving us approximately that much for yes. the old truck? Yes. Okay. For just the, it's probably metal salvage. That uh, more than from. likely, that's probably yeah. exactly what it is. The last mm -hmm. time we did an auction of old equipment here, our base prices were based on the weight of the equipment and the actual steel prices. What's the actual that? mileage on that? I couldn't tell you, Jim. The actual prices of steel is higher now. Is I, believe it is. Yeah. I believe it is. And like I said, it is a 1979 truck, yeah. one of our older fleets. Yeah. Well, that's great. Okay. All in favor of approving this contract? Uh, Aye. Right. Great. Uh, contract for a mountain low lift pump station generator. For a mountain low lift pump station generator alternative. To Taden Howard, $5,000. Move approval. Second. We had asked, we requested a proposal from Taden Howard to um, do a little letter feasibility study um, to determine what the cost would be um, to install a permanent backup generator at the low lift pump station at the Mountain Street Reservoir. Um, we don't currently have backup power at that low lift pump station. Um, so, in times of a power outage, we don't have access to one of our reservoirs. Um, that makes us a little uncomfortable uh, in certain circumstances, like the hurricane, for example, where we had a, an extended power outage and we were running the plant on the Ryan Reservoir, and then because of the degree of erosion and things in the watershed, there was a lot of material swept up in the feed brooks that got blown <coughs> into the reservoir, and that degraded the quality of the water coming into the plant. And that caused us some problems. Um, so we needed to switch over to the Mountain Street Reservoir, which we can't use if we don't have power. Um, so in this particular case, um, it didn't cause a problem that was noticeable for anybody, but we lacked, we lacked the redundancy to run this pump station and get water from the, the reservoir in an emergency if we should need it. And when they laid that pipe across the street, they didn't run any conduits for bringing power down from the generator up the hill? Uh, that is, uh, I don't think that there's a conduit run all the way that's uh, empty, and that, that's empty that we can use. We had talked about um, using some of the in-place conduit by removing some of the wiring uh, that's in the existing conduit and replacing it. Um, although for this this project, where, where are you reading that? You're no, I'm asking. I mean, you're, you're confusing me. We don't we don't need condo for this. That's the telemetry project. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's the telemetry project. We don't need condo for this one. The, the, but, uh, but, yeah, we've got a, the big propane generator up at the plant. No, it's not sized to run the pump station and the plant. We're 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 size challenged with that generator at, at the plant. If if you recall, we had some difficulties when we installed it. But it wasn't sized, in any event, it wasn't sized to handle the pump station anyway. Uh, my understanding is that there was some discussion uh, early on in the design of the water plant about does it make sense to have backup power at this pump station. That was before my time. Um, 
my understanding is the thinking was, well, you can take water by gravity from the Ryan Reservoir. Why would we ever need the pump station if the power's out? Because you can, you can take the flow by gravity. So it's a reasonable question, but I think what we saw in the hurricane was that um, if we have water quality issues with Ryan um, in a storm like we had, um, you want the flexibility and the redundancy of having multiple sources, and we don't have that. So it's a risk, you know, it's a risk management thing we're talking mm -hmm. about. This proposal here is to is to um, look at alternatives for a propane generator or diesel generator, look at some a couple of layouts and costs, so we can come back to the board and have a discussion. Uh, you know, if a generator is 200 grand, you know, you, you weigh the risk of having a hurricane in an event. Granted, these things do not happen, you know, twice a week. Mm -hmm. But when they happen, you know, you want to reduce your risk by having backup power at the cost of whatever it is. Um, we asked them to look at both propane and diesel um, generators because a diesel generator is a lot cheaper to buy, but there are uh, diesel storage issues in, uh, in a watershed that need to be discussed with DEP. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we have, you know, it's the reason we have the propane generator at the plant. But they're almost twice as the propane generator is almost twice as much. What's the size of the generator? We don't know. Approximately. Um, not sure. Like a hundred horsepower. Um, I'm not sure. It's it big. Pumps. Uh, it's you guys asking all kinds of questions. I don't know the answers to it. <laughs> 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 That's our job. I can tell you. I'll tell you this though, because I think this might answer the question. It is a big generator because we rented one during the hurricane. And it came on a tractor trailer, and it's gigantic. So it's not like something we can, uh, you know, it's not yeah, you can't stow in the garage. It's not really portable. And the problem with renting one in a storm is that everybody wants them. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have any. There's no guarantee that you can get it when you need it. Um, so that's kind of the problem. Yeah, it's a good idea for a contractor to go out and study it. So my question is more about educating myself. So are we talking about a system that's, remember that big computer in that room, it seems like that's all dependent upon electrical um, power. And that if that goes out, then it disrupts the functioning of the plant. And so I'm surprised that it wasn't more seriously considered because of the reliance on the electrical equipment that an uh, alternate source wasn't seriously considered. I'm just curious. I don't know. Are you talking about the controls of the plant? Yes. Yeah. There, right. is, there is a generator at the plant. Ah, uh, OK. So right. there's, a, there's a generator that's able to run okay. the, the treatment plant itself, oh, but okay. the, we don't have a generator to run that pump station. Oh, okay. So we're talking about one that pump might be station. across the street now I understand. down near yeah. the water. OK, OK, now I understand. All right, thank you. And if my memory serves me right, the pumping station is an afterthought. We put that pumping station in because we have gravity problems. And yeah, that was after the plant was designed. Well, the, the, the pump station became necessary when the plant got recited up on the hill. Right. And, and so it wasn't even thought of having backup generation down there. Uh, you know, I, I can't really, that was all before my time. I yeah. call it George Andrew Keaties. <laughs> I'm uh, just going back from memory, that's all. I mean, I think the concept, you know, once the plant got moved up on the hill, you know, it would have been evident that, you know, we're going to get the water up there, seeing so a pump station. But I think there was a discussion about including a generator, but because of the cost, I believe it got removed from the project um, because of the thinking that you can always take gravity, gravity flow from Ryan. Yeah. And we want to have that, you know, we want to have the discussion with the board about redundancy and risk. And when we run the system, you know, we don't, like to to have a situation where we feel like we can't provide water to the city in a you know an emergency um, event. You may you may have come after that, but that same discussion did happen at this board. When yeah, it was sure. under design. Yeah, I'm sure it did. Yeah. yeah. Just my question: uh, this weakness was revealed in the, the storm. Were there other are there other things in our system? Fire system, sewer system that were revealed to you when we had that storm there. Oh, um, wastewater was fine. I don't think so. 
And well, the wastewater has backup on every pump at the station. Yeah, nothing, nothing significant. Yeah. I mean, then we're. I mean, we got generators all over the place. Yeah, I felt like our systems were in, were in pretty good shape. But the thing that the storm revealed is that, I don't know, if I, somebody said this at a meeting, it was that the power is king. I think it was the DPW director of Wolverham. And it's true. When you have an event and you don't have power, particularly for multiple days, and the business that we're in, you know, water and sewer and, and things, you, know, you, you get to have power. And the concept that you can have, you can run down someplace or have somebody bring a portable generator when you need it, you could not get a generator that week. Mm -hmm. yeah. couldn't get one. And the wells are fine? They have sufficient backup? They don't have backup power, and that's also something that we're looking at right now is what the price would be to provide backup power to the wells. So will Tate and Howard give us a, can they give us some opinion about whether if it were up to them, they'd do this project and for that project? I mean, obviously it'd be great if we just did them both, but. This project and which other project? Oh, some way to prioritize between the wells. back up at the wells versus back up at the pump station? Well, we'd be happy to talk to the board about that and inform our own opinions about it. We haven't asked uh, Tate and Howard for an opinion about that. Dave's, the, the generator size for the wells would be a lot smaller. Pumps are pretty small in the wells um, and for those well pumps. So, you know, it would be a smaller generator and a lot, heck of a lot cheaper to provide. Um, the other thing to consider is that, you know, the, the wells generally don't provide a lot of the city's water. In an emergency, they could provide up to two thirds of a, a normal demand, um, which makes them valuable. Um, so we were looking at that, but it's a frat, uh, providing a backup generator for those two wells would be, uh, you know, a fraction of the cost of doing one at the pump station. So that's a discussion we feel like we need to have. If you're going to put a big generator down at the lowest pump station and it's 300 grand, but you can buy two generators for the wells for 50 grand, you know, which, you know, you look at the risks of the power outage and how much water you need and, you know, try to make an informed decision about how to invest. So we'll have that discussion. Mm -hmm. This, this contract is just to get the information about the Lola pump station. That's a much larger project. Dave Sparks is tracking down the costs on those other generators for the wells. Jim? Uh, in, just a question. Uh, if we were to shut down both reservoirs, the feed, could we feed the entire city with those wells? Um, we couldn't meet the entire city's demand, no. Okay. I mean, we could do like a million gallons a day. Two, yeah, you could do just yeah, just shy of <coughs> two. So if we if we ended up in that type of situation, we'd need to notify the public of water restrictions, and you really shouldn't be using the water for much of anything because you you know you'd risk um, you know trying to draw more water from from the system that was available. But the probability is that there might be power outages throughout the city, and so there'd be less demand for water anyway. Um, you know, I was using water through the hurricane. The city, you know, it was available to me, and uh, that was the one thing I was just loving. You know, I could flush my toilet, and I'm not <laughs> but, sure. But that's not true for everybody. It's true but for everybody. It's, it's, it's yeah, true. Right. Right. I could flush my it's, toilet, but there was no water to fill it back up. It's yeah. true yeah. for everybody that's on the system. Well, you know how water was the big. Yeah. Yeah. I had hot water. I didn't that's, have heat, but I had hot water. That's the kicker. There'd be, a, there'd be a reduction in demand, but everybody that's on the public water system would have it. That have you know, water available, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but no hot water. That was kind of mm -hmm. the eye opener for me. Is I went over to Dave Shearer's house. He had all four burners on the stove going, and his house was toasty. And I went home and I turned on the stove. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that. It really worked. Yeah, kitchen. Your kitchen was toasty warm. Um, okay, so so basically, uh, we should. Come to a, a vote now. Do we approve doing this five thousand dollar contract to have Tata and Howard look at the possibilities for a backup generator? You, did you move approval? Yes. yes. And we second it too. Yeah, yeah. So, all in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 <coughs> contract for a hydraulic evaluation for potential water main improvements to Tata and Howard in the amount of sixty five hundred dollars. This is a contract with Tate and Howard. Um, we've asked them to the contract in front of me, evaluate two um, 
two projects that are going on in the city, and we're seeking some advice in terms of uh, what to do in terms of water supply. The first one is related to um, some planned road reconstruction work on North Street. Um, on North Street? On North Street, which is up by Market Street, over, that, uh, over in that area. Um, where we wanted to get their opinion on uh, what size water main we should consider installing in North Street. Uh, North Street is one of the, the back feeds into, uh, water supply feeds into the industrial park, part of that sort of looped system in the vicinity of the industrial park. Um, the industrial park draws, um, you know, up to a third of the city's total water demand into that location with, a, you know, the vast majority of it coming from the coke plant, but there's a lot of city water use in that area. So we want to make an intelligent decision about the size of the water mains in this part of town so that we can incorporate that water main replacement uh, in the North Street project. So we've asked them to, uh, to look at a water model in that, in the vicinity of uh, Damon Road, um, North Street, um, Prospect Street, sort of the main um, lines that come in, in and around the industrial park, so that we can make a decision about how to um, replace that line, either increase the size or replace it in kind um, in terms of diameter or possibly cleaning and lining um, the 8-inch line that's in there now. So we've got a few questions. Um, it's, it's, you know, a project that's, I forget what the water main estimate was, but might be a couple hundred grand in, in water pipe, uh, or 400. So it's about a, four, you know, a decision involving about $400,000, so we wanted to get to some input and make sure we were doing the right thing there. The second part of this proposal is uh, seeking some advice from them about um, a development proposal up uh, at Linda Manor. There's a retirement facility that's proposed up there. Um, they're looking for a connection to the city's uh, potable water system. There are some aspects of that proposal that we're not completely comfortable with at this point. Um, we have uh, some water pressure and flow issues. That's part of the Leeds high pressure system that's up on the hill. Um, they're looking at doing, uh, they've got a proposal um, now that involves connection to the city water system. Uh, we've had preliminary discussions with them because of issues with flow that they can only, we would limit the amount of flow that they could take out, but they'd need a storage tank to store it in and then a booster pump uh, to, to boost it to the building. Um, there's some things about that proposal that make us uncomfortable. We're looking for a professional opinion from them um, about the proposal up there for that project. And that's going to involve a review of uh, the Leeds high pressure system, which runs off the Audubon Road tank, is what sets the pressure in that system. So those two projects are uh, total uh, an estimated fee of 6500 not to exceed. Right. Um, for the portion of the work that relates to North Street, it sounds like the proposal is to work with a a portion of our a, a portion of the model of our distribution system rather than the whole distribution system. Right. And um, it, you and Tate and Howard both comfortable that that will get us close enough to a, a good answer. They are. They feel if we've got some updated fire flow information, <coughs> they can um, if they can check the data that we have compared to the to the Dewberry model, which was the last version of it, that it would be suitable for making a decision of this type. Don Tata was, was reassuring in that regard. Okay. And in, and for both project locations, um, will they be looking at fire flow demands in addition to usage? The uh, the fire flow on North Street, I think they will be looking at. The uh, fire flow on uh, the Zoe retirement proposal, they're only looking for potable water demand, not fire flow. We don't have enough water in that right. leach system to provide fire flow. So the answer would be no on the Zoe retirement project. So the project would then be built without a sprinkler system? They're, they've got an on-site well, they're saying, that they would use for, um, for sprinkling, for fire protection. Which, you know, it's, uh, that's a Chief Duggan. Right, sure. It's not a deep issue. The, the uh, project that they're talking about up there is a 14-bed addition uh, plus an assisted living facility right. uh, plus a rehabilitation center. 
so they've got quite an ambitious project going and uh, the homework that would be done by this, the study that would be warranted. Are they currently on city water but this is going to increase the amount of use or? They currently have a well for when the manor is currently on a well. Um, they, they, I forget exactly, do you, I don't know if you, have a, if you recall, they do have a well out there which they've been having a problem with yield, but they're also connected to the city system. No, they have some storage tanks that they use for storage capacity and for fire. And the tanks, something have the tanks and they lost the water out of it. So they had pumpers, and trucks, pumps, and tanker trucks parked up there for a period of time while they're resolving their water issues. And yeah, they were hit by lightning. I don't, I don't know what happened, yeah. but I know they had uh, uh, tanker trucks up there full of water ready to go. If everyone's comfortable, uh, all in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 Great. Um, the mystery photo with your package is next. Mystery photo. This is our barn's <coughs> next door. And, uh, Yesterday, I got a call from the highway superintendent and said, Ned, you need to come immediately over here and take a look. And apparently one of the trucks had driven over this area and <clears throat> the floor fell down about four feet. Um, but the truck didn't go down under with it, too. Mm -hmm. Underneath the barns next door, it's a kind of an open, uh, not a slab on grade, but there's foundation walls about every six feet on center. And there's slabs that were poured on top of it. These slabs are about three inches thick of concrete and you know you're, we're putting 10 wheel trucks full of sand and sanders in there and it failed. So we've asked Ty and Bond, uh, they came out today with a structural engineer, looked at it, they're going to give us some uh, information and proposals as to what we may be able to do uh, with that next door to fix it. Right now we have a steel plate on top of it, uh, Louis Hasbrook, the building commissioner, has been out and looked at it and uh, said you shouldn't be driving trucks over that, but if you put steel plates down, you could do that. So that's our immediate fix, is looking to steel plate the entire run of the barn through this six foot wide area. As you notice, you probably came in tonight, all the trucks are parked outside. Those are all the vehicles that are in storage in that barn that need this alleyway to come in and out. Do we have enough steel to do that? No. no. I didn't think about We're going to have to buy uh, a series of a bunch of steel. <laughs> You're talking thousands of dollars, too. I think we can do it well under probably 10 to 12, I think. Yeah. It's still going to cost some money. And so then we got to come up with a permanent fix. Yeah. I think we need a new facility. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a big problem because of the, the trucks and equipment that we need to store in there. And when you look at that, it's amazing that it hasn't failed before. I mean, the thickness of that concrete, which is a clear span, is only about three inches thick, which is, uh, is with, with no reason. Is it way or is it arched and only collapsed in the middle? It just seems impossible that a six-foot span only three inches thick would support yeah. Yeah. an 80,000-pound truck fully loaded, something like that. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's got to be Yeah, it's amazing. Up there. It's amazing. 60? Yeah. 50? A lot. Yeah, a lot, exactly. Three inches of concrete. And especially during the winter time when these sander trucks are filled and ready to go on a moment's notice. Oh, exactly. That's what I max you know, max right. a lot of weight. So, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is, um, isn't our current plan to continue to use these barns <coughs> even with the new facility for vehicle storage? Yeah. yeah. This was phase three, was replacement right. of the barn, so it's the last nine million dollar phase of the project. So even if we went ahead and built what we were looking at a month or two ago. Sixteen million dollars is still left this. behind, that's correct. I guess that starts to answer my second thought which was um, could you rent the plates but it seems like we're going to need plates for a long time. But I, I do think steel plates are available on a rental basis. But it's an issue of duration. And Flowable fill is the same cost as the concrete, right? But it flows. Mm -hmm. And it will support weight. I mean, you could. We had a discussion with Client Bond about that as a potential yeah. option. Actually, the structural guy that came out today was. Uh, seemed like he had a lot of creative ideas for working with an old building. It's a disaster. 
Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things we want to have him look at. He was discussing flowable fill. I think the problem is that there are multiple uh, the multiple areas beneath the slab, and you need to figure out if you're going to pump flowable fill in, where is it going to go? Um, because there are there are channels under each bay. Yeah. Um, so there's some investigation work that needs to be done in terms of how that's going to work. But I have to excuse myself. Thank you, everyone. And for how long? And then what about all the other areas that haven't collapsed yet? It's just the worst one. I just think I suspect global fill might be the winner in terms of cost and you know ultimate solution. I think it's a matter of timing. We need to get those trucks back into the building right. as soon as possible. Right. And figuring out whether flowable fill is going to work is something that's going to take a. Little, I think it's going to take a little bit of time just yeah. because of the. You know what's happening under that under that slab is uh, uh, it's, it's a little mind-boggling mm -hmm. to try to figure out how it's going to function. But flowable fill is definitely an idea that we came up with. Another idea that we, we came up with was you know why don't we pull back this section that that whole this that whole length of the section is like 100 feet 120 feet long. Pull it all back and then backfill the channel with with gravel and then you could set a pad or something on top of that. But then the issue with that is that it, it poses um, bearing stresses on the foundation on either side of the open channel, which are not backfilled themselves. There is an open space on, either, on the other side. Yeah. So loading that poses a potential problem um, as well. So it's just, you know, it's a loose thread on a sweater scenario. And the more you look at it, the more you're like, well, geez, that might cause another problem, and that might cause another problem. And um, it's a little bit of a disaster. We're going to be spending a fair amount of money trying to save this building, just so it'll be usable. Um, and when you look at it, it's you know it's, it's, it wouldn't be my wouldn't be my place to invest in it with my own personal money, but you know, maybe it is my personal. Money. In, a way, in a way, it is. Um, all right, so no action is required. No action is required. We're getting a, we're getting a price in the steel plates, which I think is going to be the short-term solution. It might be an emergency uh, retirement. We're getting a, a, a proposal from time bond to have them look at sort of a, a longer 10-year type of solution. What can we do to make it work? And we'll be back in front of the board with that. All right. Uh, discussion of the implementation of solid waste management on closing with the landfill. We talked a little bit about this last week, or the week before we got here. Mm -hmm. um, we were just putting on the idea. I think that there was some sense that it might make sense for us to form a little subcommittee to sort of do updates and to get out a little bit of an implementation plan. Yeah, I got a call yesterday from the Gazette. They're, perhaps they picked it up from the last meeting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're asking what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think we, we discussed it. And, uh, certainly, uh, we have to put out some kind of a plan as to, and, and it has to be really a timeline. Uh, by this time, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. or, and, and the steps that are going to have to be taken. So we're approximately 12 months out from closing the landfill at yeah. this point? Yeah. yeah. Would, would you close it in the winter, or would, or would you hold it for the spring? Well, the construction would happen in the starting in the springtime. But you, the problem is, is the permits. If we were to have a subcommittee on this, what would be the due date by which you would have to have um, outcomes from the um, committee in order to make timely decisions? Six thirty. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. That's it. I've actually got a bit of good news on the schedule. Um, I, I put together a little bar chart mm -hmm. and, and passed that around with a memo. And a good, a good amount of the time that we were falling behind on was the DEP site assignment permit process for that. And after the last meeting, you know, we had some verbal discussions with the department about what the rules are and what the permits were that were necessary. And um, after the last meeting, I went back in my office and I reread the regulations and I was scratching my head saying, I can't believe we need to get a 
site assignment revision for this. It just doesn't really make sense. So I went through all the regulations. I put a link to email together to the state and said, well, this is kind of how I'm reading it. I don't think we really need to go through this lengthy process. And, and they replied pretty quickly. And I guess they had the regional office had checked with the folks in Boston and came back and said, well, you're right. You don't need to go back and modify that so site assignment yes. permit. So, um, so that buys a little bit of time because that's a lengthy process. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of steps and public yeah, things. Yeah. Right. So we can jump right into the, we still need to get an operating permit for that. Mm -hmm. Which is, um, you know, a little bit easier. It might take us a couple of weeks to get the application together, and mm -hmm. DEP would issue a draft permit, and it might be a, a public notice type of thing. So um, we've bought a little bit of time through that. Yeah. Uh, so. so perhaps nothing really needs to happen quite this early in the process. I would love for something to happen right now. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just in terms of the subcommittee reviewing. Mm -hmm. um, updating self updating and reviewing information um, that was discussed at the task force. Yeah, I think since the, I mean, since that report came out, I mean, there have been some changes. You know, we've got the DUSO facility that's opened up on Route 10. Right. We wanted to get some of our own data to see how that was impacting um, our numbers. And we, I guess it's been six months. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the task force ended in March, around March of last year. Mm -hmm. So it's been a few months. Um, no, I'm thinking since do so opened up. Oh, well, so yeah. Parts of six months. Yeah. I mean, um, have we seen uh, a volume change since do so has opened? Or do we have any idea what how much he's picking up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the exact numbers, but it, it's it's not an insignificant amount. I mean, they were the biggest customer at the landfill, and the fact that they're not using the landfill anymore um, is something that we see on the scales. Um, and I think the numbers were down, you know, it could have been 15, just picking numbers off the top of my head without having actual facts, you know, probably 15 or 20 percent tonnage was down last year. Um, and the vast majority of that was due to uh, do so not using the landfill anymore. The rest of it's probably attributable to the down economy. Um, so it's you know it's something we see at the landfill. I'm not sure how much of an impact it has on um, what we want to do from the city's perspective in terms of options. Um, Have we noticed much of a drop off here in, in the drop off business? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't think we've seen a huge drop off. I think we may have, there may be a few. I haven't checked on the vehicle permits lately to see where those have ended up, but I can check with Karen to see how much of a drop off of that. And when we switched to the the bag system, we did it to better align revenues with the tonnage that was coming in. It's probably a good time to be taking a look at seeing whether or not that's bearing out. So it feels like there's a couple questions that are floating around that we could. Well, uh, this is just directly first to the um, uh, landfill, did you know if we covered our cost for last year and if yeah. we made any contributions to the Cellar Voice Enterprise Fund? Yeah, I mean, the, the facility is, you know, it's in the black, okay. so, you know, we're not losing money out there, but, okay, good. you know, month, month, every every month we're making money, so. Okay, all right. Um, well, yeah. So, so we have some time. I think, you know, I, I'm just thinking, I was reading the materials that we missed and reading the materials you put out. Thank you for putting those together, Jim. And I, you know, I was just thinking back to our discussion at the um, for the ta the mayor's task force that the concern was not to do too much now and to you know do keep things sort of, sort of as they were and and then then revisit it after a year. So that means like going ahead and doing the um, Glendale Road, keeping that open, which we need anyway for the for the uh, getting rid of a lot of waste or certain kinds of waste that locusts can't take care of. But the idea that that if the task, I'm trying to think about what the purpose of the task force, the subcommittee task force would be, which is maybe refining time, refining some of these answers. But really, we do need to go ahead with the keeping Glendale Road open. So the issue is really more, we need to get 
we need to get going with closing the landfill before we can make the next generation of decisions in terms of if we want to go to pick up or if we want to go to um, other types of. Um, I think one of the one of the thoughts I had about the subcommittee myself, and I I thought it was a good idea when we talked about the last meeting was was simply to revisit a lot of the assumptions that we had made during the task force. Uh, obviously, Rowan and Terry were. Um, a little, you know, involved in, in that task force, but we had made a lot of uh, a lot of assumptions in terms of you know which facilities, what days they're going to be open, what the hours are, mm -hmm. the types of materials we're going to collect, how programs are going to be funded, and um, you know we, we dealt with the big things, but there's still a lot of cert, you know, there's not a lot, but there's you know some service type questions that that we need to review, you know, with the board in terms of the services that the city should be providing and will be providing or you know I think there's a few decisions there that it might be good in a subcommittee format to be able to talk about what some of those are and, and get some input and make sure that um, you know we're, we're headed in the right direction and have a wider board discussion about it. When, the, when this topic came up two weeks ago it seemed to me that the, the board hasn't taken an action regarding the recommendations of the task force and that the recommendations aren't in a form that, that we could vote on them tonight and say, yes, this is what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So that means it, it requires further development. And it right. certainly seemed to me in our discussions the last time that it isn't really conducive to accomplishing it at a board meeting where we talk about a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought um, the committee approach would work. And, mm -hmm. it, and we're going to be asked to make decisions um, that require spending money in some cases that are part of this plan, but we haven't adopted the plan yet. Mm -hmm. And like permitting, for example, mm -hmm. are we really going to keep the Glendale Road facility open? Well, we haven't said we are, mm -hmm. so why should we be spending money on it? Mm -hmm. So I, that's why I thought it all made sense. Mm -hmm. Are there people on the board who are interested in being in this they should have let me form it last time. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that the chair at the last meeting showed great constraint in not appointing the committee. Oh. I, I was badgered to. from forming <laughs> I wanted ready. to, and they he wouldn't let me. It down. Oh. They didn't want leadership. True. Ignoring somebody's leadership is not a good thing. You know, well, you don't up. know who was going to be on the committee, so you... <laughs> stepped up, he put his shoulder to the wheel, he and he did. shot him down. But his idea was the people aren't here, though. It was Terry and Rob. Automatically selected. That's who we nominated. We were like this close. So you weren't really putting your shoulder to the wheel. I really felt that you should have a chance to comment. Are you interested in being on this committee? Do you have that kind of time? Uh, I have the time. I, I would do it. But I, I thought that people that had better insights into the task force process ought to be on the committee also. And, and although I was joking at the time, I wasn't complete. I mean, I was yeah, really serious. I, well, I, plus I you wouldn't here. mind participating. I'm The next two months are just crazy for me, so I'm pretty much out of extracurricular time. So. I'm interested, but you know, I don't, I don't want to hold the committee up. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> a presentation to the UN. Don't look oh, cool. like that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Ooh. That's right. Um, so I'm, I'm not okay. speaking outside right now. MJ, I see you. I, I am interested in it, although I don't know that we have to escalate it to committee standing. I think a, a, a working group just to sort of flush ideas out and, and mm -hmm. bring them back to the the board would be. Yeah, because I think we all want to we all want to have discussions about it at our board yeah. meeting, but the idea of like putting framework. in a framework that we yeah. can be educated, maybe the next step. Mm -hmm. Jim, this is something you'd be working with a subset of us. I also think it's a good idea to get started on it before budget time. Yeah, yes, that's a good point. That's, 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 yeah. You did that on purpose, so you're here with the plan. It was pretty quick. Yeah, it was. Uh, Something's going yeah, crazy. Something. Mm. Has any contacts been made with the mayor? Or have we gotten a response from the mayor on the state plan? 
I don't, we know that Ned said he was arranging a meeting with the mayor. He still hadn't done it. Yeah, nothing, nothing has happened yet. At the last meeting he said that he was all uh, are you, you over there in the gallery? I'm sorry, I'm Do totally distracted. Ah. You know Mimi has a, a comment she'd like to make. Well, do you know if Ned set up the time to meet with the mayor to talk about the Mass DOT site? He is not. Okay. Well, I, one of the things I was curious about tonight, and, and I know Ned has already left, but at the last city council meeting, they asked, they've requested him to come at, to their next one to give an update on what's happening with the with the landfill and the closure so i guess i'm just curious i don't know if i i didn't actually like i don't know what his response was i don't know if you know jim but is he planning on creating a presentation or is that being put on hold until the board has done something i we'll think that's that the, uh, my understanding is that ned will be presenting in front of the council an update on the the status of the solid waste enterprise fund because there were uh, I haven't been involved in it, but apparently there were some questions about the status of the fund, um, you know, revenues. And so it's more of a fiscal question. Yeah, oh, okay. more of a fiscal question. Uh, and, you know, as far as, I think Ned has talked to the mayor about needing to set up a meeting and make a decision on the MassDOT site, so he's he's approached the mayor about that, but a, a meeting date hasn't been set. And it's, it might be a little bit of a flux, too, with the whole, I don't, I don't know how the mayor feels about the city solicitor, and, you know, it's clearly a matter that, you need legal, um, you know, uh, you want to get a legal opinion about it. Um, so I'm not sure if he's, if the mayor wants to wait until a new city solicitor is in place or, or what. But we're doing what we can to, to move forward. Okay, so we should schedule a meeting with a loose subcommittee for February to start talking about what the drop-off center arrangement might look like a year from now? That would be the focus of this subcommittee? Yeah, I think, and, you know, I, I thought that it would be looking at um, the recommendations of the task force, reviewing the assumptions and things with the board members on that, and make sure that everyone was on board with um, the concept of what these facilities are going to be and what the charges are going to be and, mm -hmm. and how they're going to work. I was just thinking that we have started doing some of the um, recommendations of the task force, and so maybe looking at all the, of course, I guess that's up to the subcommittee, and since I've already said I can't do it, I'll just keep my mouth shut. Never mind. I don't think there's a lot of heavy, I don't think there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done. Right, right. Uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot, a lot of decisions that, and assumptions that were made that need to be reviewed and, and understood, mm -hmm. and there were some, there were some, you know, not every decision was made in that task force. That task force was a little bit of a higher level, not mm -hmm. down to the nuts and bolts of how is this thing going to work. And I think we need to drill down a little bit and, and touch on some of that stuff. So you could put on a call uh, sometime early to mid-February, perhaps, for getting together? Yep. And I would be sending that call to... I'll be out of town from the 8th to the 20th. Of February? Mm. February 6th is a good meeting day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah, so when are you ready to? I think David is also interested in it. I'm, I, yes, I would. Yeah. I'd, be willing to. I'd probably come. If I can, I, I'd like to come. I'll do it. Can't have four. Can't have four. Okay. Can't have four? No. no. Four. Mm -hmm. Need three. Three. So Dave, Mike, and the Terry. boys will take care of it. Terry. Oh, that. <laughs> oh, <Jeff>. that. <laughs> I don't think so. I'd like to be involved, please. Yeah. Uh, I could Thank call you. back. I mean, you, well, you and I can talk about. It. Okay. All right, that'd be fine. Uh, Great. You know, we sat through all the, the staff sat through all the task force meetings, so. Well, it's it's always great to have the board perspective from having gone through the process, and you know, we could try to carry the torch. You don't really need us. Well, that's not what I was going to say. It's so much clearer if you say it, Jim. Okay, uh, let's see. A corrosion control facility update. So I guess so. We're all set on that subcommittee. I think so. Okay. 
time to close the corrosion control facility? Well, actually, it's not. Which is why it's on the agenda. Yeah. Um, we had high hopes um, for closing the corrosion control facility. As the Board of Recallers have approved a couple of contracts, we had a, uh, a feasibility study done by AECOM that looked at the financial feasibility of closing this corrosion control facility and adding uh, orthophosphate up at the filter plant. And the concept at the time was to take a chemical room where we could add potassium permanganate, which we don't add, and use that equipment to add phosphate up there. Made a lot of sense. We could close this building, we could move the chemical, we'd have everything under one roof, and make the management easier, would save some money. Um, we applied to DEP for a permit um, to do that, and they sent us a permit um, back in early January, and um, basically the the permit was fine. There was tons of conditions which we had expected in terms of monitoring and, and that sort of thing. But um, the one thing that we weren't expecting was that um, the department required that we maintain equipment to add potassium permanganate up at the filter plant. So um, that defeats the purpose of the whole project because they're saying you need to have equipment to add both the phosphate and equipment to add the potassium permanganate. Um, and if we needed to do that, it would add, you know, it would come at the cost of, I don't know, two or three hundred thousand dollars or, or more to add a room with the chemical containment areas and the equipment and the pumps and, all, and that sort of thing. Um, so we had a discussion with them and um, the reason for it is that um, there's some evolving thoughts within the regulatory environment about um, manganese in drinking water. Right now, the drinking water uh, standard for manganese is a secondary standard, a non-health standard, sort of an aesthetic standard, 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. It's related to staining of plumbing fixtures and things like that. Um, there's been more research done uh, recently on the impact of uh, manganese concentrations on, on infants and their cognitive abilities um, of, of young children. And, um, EPA has issued um, different exposure, lifetime exposure limits for manganese as guidelines of 0.3 milligrams per liter. Um, DEP, their Office of Research and Standards, is actually looking at all uh, available data relative to manganese concentrations and what the impact is on health. Um, they're considering um, regulating it to some other amount. So the, the issue is that the potassium permanganate equipment that we have would help us remove manganese from the drinking water. So the department's not comfortable with this manganese drinking water standard in flux, giving us an approval to take that equipment and use it for something else. So, you know, from that perspective, it makes sense. Um, we were aware of the manganese, the evolving manganese issue through some discussions with Dave Reckow, who's kept us up to speed and I feel like we're pretty knowledgeable in it. Um, what we had decided internally and and had a discussion with DEP about this is that um, we're going to continue to, to get manganese concentrations from our water supplies from the reservoirs so we can develop a good database on what the concentrations are over the next year and maybe you know eight months or a year from now we'll revisit the situation with DEP perhaps their office of research and standards would have completed their study on what the standard would be and then we can see if, if things have shaken down a little bit what we would do but uh, in the meantime, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing the last few years on corrosion and revisit things in a year and see if we can make a change. Um, okay, great. Any questions? Uh, next is solid waste update. Uh, next informational, we had a meeting this morning. Uh, I was there, Dave was there, um, Ned, Jim. Uh, Dave Sparks, and I think we may have already approved uh, a contract with Camp Dresser and McKee to study our drinking water. Um, never approved the contract. No. Never quite got approved? Okay. I think it got, I think it got table. Table, okay. Yes. So this is a, uh, this is like a, in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million dollars. They were going to um, build a hydraulic model of our system. So, for example, uh, when Linda Manor came forward and said they wanted to add some beds, uh, 
you could fairly easily predict how much ebb uh, demand there might be from this new facility. And if we have a, a hydraulic computer model, someone within the department presumably could input this new additional demand and the computer would think for a minute and tell us whether there are any issues or if there were what they were. So the department feels strongly they need this hydraulic model. In the process of putting that out to bid, for example, Jim, you spoke at a meeting recently and wondered about how confident we are that we have sufficient water supply moving in out 50 or 100 years. So that, that question got thrown into the hopper. Um, the staff was thinking, well, here's this big uh, study. Perhaps the board would like to have engineers come and make a presentation. So there's $10,000 for public meetings that got put into the, uh, the program. Um, you pick through it, and there are a lot of things added into the, you know, I mean, you got this bid going out. Let's, how about this question? No, we've always wondered about that. <clears throat> it took a fifty or $75,000 problem, hydraulic model, uh, and a few fairly tightly focused questions that the staff feels they really need and turn that into a hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar project. So we've been talking, uh, Mike and David, myself and Jim and Ned and, and, and Jim, uh, we've been talking about is it really necessary to do all of that? Do we really need ten thousand dollars worth of public meetings? Uh, do we need a thirty thousand dollar summary after they've already done the individual pieces. Each piece, you would assume, comes with an engineering memorandum summarizing what they found in these pieces, but there's $30,000 to create a comprehensive narrative, kind of pulling it all together. And again, you wonder, who's that for? Or at least I was, and, and mm -hmm. to some extent, we all were. So the meeting this morning was kind of to kick that around, and, and Jim, I, I hope you'll speak up at the end and kind of give me your perspective on it. But, we, we kind of reached the opinion this morning that maybe it was sufficient to just treat this as a, a narrower question, uh, rely on the staff to let us know uh, if, they, if there are some policy implications from the hydraulic model, or um, I'll give you another example. <clears throat> the, the new revised uh, contract we're looking for is going to identify some priorities for which water projects, want, this is drinking water again, which water projects really are the most pressing that we ought to consider getting to work on. Now an elaboration on that that they did for the city of Boston was they did a very elaborate math or a, a, a economic model of this and they came up with a, an annualized cost of addressing all of these problems for example, over 50 years. And it was a fairly elaborate economic modeling process, which was would cost $7,000. So we, we, have, we already have the list of the problems with approximate costs. Do we need that $7,000 issue, you know, economic model? Or is it sufficient to know that here's the list, there's the priority, you know, are we going to roll up our sleeves and tackle number one? Or is this not the right year for it? Do we need that sophisticated economic model when really it's kind of a political question? So I think it's fair to say we all agreed to strip it back down to the core engineering questions. And I, I just thought we should talk about that and make sure that everyone thinks that's okay. Gary? I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> the last water system study that was done is only about five or six years old, isn't it? Uh, it might be eight or, okay. eight or nine, possibly. Is, would that be some value? Would it, would it be of some value to this study? There is value to it. The proposals that we received were based on, you know, we provided, <coughs> we pro we provided consultants the model that we have and the reports that we have. Yeah. So they were, they were, were sort of building on work that has been done. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes. Right. And, and in that 
system-wide study, there was a there were a number of projects that were identified, and I think that we moved ahead on some of them too. We did quite a few of them. Yeah. Um, one of them that came up tonight, or at least the mention of the water tower on Audubon Road, I think there was a piece to that study that said we needed to raise it, I think, or replace it or it's something. It's the Turkey Hill Road tank. Oh, for Turkey Hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the uh, change because the water plant got changed. Is there an elevation change? That's uh, that's one of the things that's changed recently. Is the, the hydraulic the hydraulics of the system have changed because of the clear well of the water plant. It used to run off the elevation of the reservoir at Mountain Street, and now it runs up. The pressure in the system is set by the the clear well of the plant. It's a little bit higher. Right. So the concept, and now if I can just speak to to um, to this for a minute. Um, you know, I thought it was an excellent meeting to, to, to have a discussion about these things. And, um, you know, I, w I was the primary author of the request for proposals in terms of what we were asking the consultants to propose on. And, um, and my thought on it was, um, there's a couple of things. One, that the majority of the scope that we'd asked for uh, is scope that's commonly done for water master plan for any utility. So it's sort of a soup to nuts. We're going to look at all of these things going to develop this big report and then it's going to have a lot of recommendations and we're going to try to look at uh, using that as a guide to determine capital investment. And, um, you know, there's, you know, it's an expensive proposition as, as Terry uh, has touched on and, you know, it was always my feeling that uh, we're trying to provide as much information to the board as we can because we're making a lot of decisions about capital projects. We talked about North Street tonight's $400,000. We want to make sure that the decisions we're making on these projects are sound decisions that are prioritized appropriately and that you have good information making decisions about the budget. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I think what really, um, you know, I learned in the meeting today was that um, I feel like we have a very capable staff here at the city um, within the engineering department. I feel like we have the ability to make recommendations and communicate well to the board members in terms of what we feel priority should be in importance. And I feel that we're also capable of communicating advice that we're getting from outside experts if it's the water system or something else. So what came out of the meeting today um, for me was that rather than preparing a big master plan report, um, we can get technical information for a lot of the tasks that were done um, with some reason technical memorandum format or some other means where we can have the hard nuts and bolts engineering done with without a lot of, I guess we were calling it, a lot of fluff in a big report and just get to the heart of the matter and then rather than having public meetings or a lot of, um, you know, big document prepared would streamline the approach to the work that's done, would have more staff involvement in terms of some of the tasks that do get done and it results in a significant savings for the city and you know if the board's happy with that um, you know type of information from us in terms of decision making about budgets and projects and the things that we're talking about we're very happy you know with to do the project that way there's a lot of different ways to get the information we need to make sound decisions and i think what came out of the meeting today for me was that the board doesn't necessarily need a big report we don't need to have consultants, engineers from outside come in, uh, you know, I feel like we're fully capable of looking at work that consultants do and can communicate that well to the board, so if we need to make decisions about budgets and capital improvements that, um, you know, we're, we're capable of doing that. Um, so the, the, the thought on the water study was that um, we talked about some changes that could be made to the scope to streamline it and approach it in a much more um, cost-effective cost way, in a way that um, sort of strips down the non-essential, if you want to call it that, and some non-essential related work, and uh, and come back to the board with a proposal um, to do the water, to do the hydraulic model, and some of the other tasks we feel are really necessary. Seem okay. It it sounds good to me. I I have a client that. I've sort of drifted toward this approach with because we found ourselves getting bogged down and spending too much time on reports and and worrying about the wording of the reports when and, and it really didn't have much to do with the technical information that, that supported it. So um, more more 
deliverables in the form of um, memorandum, memoranda, technical memoranda, even in bullet format without a lot of words, but still have the technical information supporting it, I think works. And, and as long as, as this board realizes that's what we're getting, and I, I think it works real well, I'd support that. Okay. Okay. I don't think we need a vote or anything, but just wanted to make sure everyone knew we've been talking about this. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great direction to go. Yeah, I'm impressed that the staff is confident that they can build up the larger picture we would need that. I mean, that they can make some judgments as we're getting these smaller reports. Yeah, I think part of it is that, um, you know, it's, it's good for us to hear that the board has confidence in our ability, because there's always the issue of, and actually I was talking to Jim earlier about this today, um, sometimes there's a, a sense that because we're city staff, we're somehow not qualified or we're not bringing good information to the board, so maybe there's a feeling like you need to have the high price consultant come in and organize things and tell you what you need to do and you know we feel like we're, we're fully capable of taking these memorandum and, and other information that we're getting from other consultants like GZA and the dams or whatever the circumstance is and, and able to, to take that information and communicate to the board the importance of it to be able to prioritize it and um, so we're, we're fully comfortable you know doing that and, and if we weren't you know would be the first to let you know. Um, we did have a discussion as well it was just that came up during the course of the meeting about um, potentially needing another staff person. We, we are straight out right now and we have a lot of other projects that are coming up that we're capable of doing, would be capable of doing them in-house, but we don't have enough people to take care of them. So we're, we're looking at uh, the option possibly in the, in the next fiscal year of adding another staff engineer that will allow us to do more design work in-house and do some things that we've been hiring uh, consultants to do for us, and mm -hmm. we feel feel like we're fully capable of doing it. We have, uh, uh, well, we're we pretty much expended about one hundred eighty thousand dollars on stormwater. We're in the middle of a uh, wastewater study that's eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand. Uh, we we have about six hundred thousand dollars unexpended or have, that we have yet to spend on that study. Mm -hmm. And this water study is a hundred, two hundred thousand. Um, so you're thinking like it's a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Is there, if we had a one more engineer on staff, could that million turn into a half a million plus several years of a staffer? Mm -hmm. You know, the, Mike and I have talked about it, it's a little unpredictable. Jim and I have talked about it, but th that's sort of what was leading to this idea. But, yeah. Maybe there's room for a little bit of staff, a little bit of, a little bit of both. And remember on the stand tech um, debacle that the staff did jump in and do quite a bit of work there, um, which was very impressive. And yet they were they were educated about yeah. it. But um, that was I mean because that was a great example of a huge, not as huge maybe as the water project, but a huge um, issue that just kept getting. You know, environmental aspects, chemical aspects. You know, it just kept multiplying, and uh, and it was like hard to know where to cut it off. So the idea of building our foundation with a lot of very specific reports and having the staff take, I think. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think we've proved over the years that uh, it's more efficient to hire staff in than it is to put reports out. I mean, our engineering department has always done great work. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember, we're running a business here. Mm -hmm. The Enterprise Fund and the Water Fund are businesses. Mm -hmm. And the most economic thing to do is to hire the staff in and instead of going outside for reports. Mm -hmm. We have, does the department do a sort of like an annual work plan, sort of beyond the day-to-day -day operational? Do, do we ever ask that they sort of give us their, their big picture of the big things they're tackling this year? Because sometimes I feel like well, we're... the capital, well, I mean, when we're doing the budget, yeah, that, that's sort of a... But it, it's always numbers like that, you know, it always feels mm -hmm. like it's a, yeah. other than 
you know, it would be incredibly helpful for me yeah. like before we get goals. to the numbers. Sort of setting out, you know, these are the big things that we need to tackle, and then mm -hmm. when then we when we start dealing with the budget for next year, you know, that's already got sort of the contextual background for that to better understand yeah. the, the challenging of balancing the numbers. Something new goals. Personal goals, professional goals. <laughs> no, no, just a, and and I'm not talking about a big fancy glitzy report. Just you know, just a conversation with yeah. the department about you know what they've got on their plate, and how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the interesting thing for us is that uh, within the engineering division, that it's always a juggling act to determine for the staff we have what we can accomplish with the, with the people we have in the time that we have it. Mm -hmm. And I've had this discussion with some individual board members, but. Um, we have to look at the projects that we that are priority to get done, and if we can fit them in with the people that we have in a schedule that uh, that's acceptable, we'll do them in house. If it's a project that we want to move ahead, and we know we could do it in house, but we don't have the time, sometimes we'll hire a consultant to do it. Um, and we have, we've got to, we'll have a couple of contracts in front of the board relative to that um, soon for a couple of projects that we know we could do internally, but we don't have the time to do them. So it's always a little bit of a, a match between. The staff we have, the schedules of the projects and the priorities, and then whether we have a way to pay for a consultant to help us with something. So on, on the water or sewer side, because of the enterprise funds, um, we have money sometimes to hire a consultant to do a design project in those funds, whereas if it was a general fund type project, um, we try to do those with the people, with the staff we have, because if there's no other way um, that we could hire anybody to do those types of projects that don't have any funding. So it's sort of a prioritization, and we look, we frequently look at what the assignments are and these schedules to determine whether we can do it. Um, we had, I can give you one example. We had just um, requested a proposal from, uh, from a consultant to help us with a new water line replacement project up on North King Street. Pretty straightforward, nuts and bolts project. It kills me that we don't have time to do it. <coughs> but we went through all our projects and the staff and what everyone's going to be working on. And it's a high priority project for us and we can't do it. So we, we have to hire someone so that we can get that water main replaced in the spring. Um, and, there, and there are other projects you know, similar to that. Okay. So let's, again, no action required. Gary, did we miss something? No, I don't think so. Pet project you'd like to talk about? <laughs> Not that I can think of. Okay. Jeff? We had a couple of uh, things that went on that um, there was some uh, bills in the legislature that we were tracking and, and uh, could we get an update at the next meeting on those as to where they are and if there's anything happening? One was the Cocot thing maybe you're yeah. thinking about. Yeah, I was wondering yeah. about that myself. Um, on Fish and wildlife. Water, water and water. conservation, yeah. Yeah. conservation um, decisions. I don't think there's been much movement on that. I wasn't here at that particular board meeting when that was discussed. We had drafted a letter yeah. to yeah. send to Cocot. Yeah. The letter never got sent. I think the board wanted to try to have staff set up a meeting with, yes. Yes. with, and, with, yeah. with the representative. I don't think it is has moved on that. Um, there was also pending, uh, there was a, a pending, um, ballot question on limiting um, on enter limiting enterprise fund rate increases to two and a half percent. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And uh, they failed to get, uh, that, that initiative failed to get the number of uh, signatures to get the question on the ballot. Oh. So that's, uh, that's, that's gone by, that, the, way. That's that's gone by the wayside. Yeah. Yeah. Mike? Nothing. Me too. Okay. Motion we adjourn. Excellent. Second. All in favor? Aye.